This will be the first of two lectures on Chinese paintings of gardens. This one, a general treatment of the subject category, uh, looking at how the different forms that Chinese paintings took uh, can be adapted to depicting, or better yet, memorializing in pictorial form, the Chinese garden. The second lecture will be about, among other things, a particularly remarkable example of such a work, an album by the late Ming master Zhang Hong that pictorializes a great garden of that time in a very unprecedented, and to my knowledge, never repeated way. Uh, it will also treat other works by Zhang Hong, as well as several by his contemporary Wu Bin, and it will consider the pictorial consequences of the injection of a new idea into late Ming painting, an idea probably aroused by the Chinese artist's exposure to foreign European pictorial art. What if instead of simply following traditional Chinese practice, we were to compose a picture from a, sim a single vantage point and depict things in it as if they were seen from that particular angle. And uh, much of this lecture will be devoted to considering the consequences of that revolutionary idea, which I hasten to say uh, didn't really revolutionize Chinese painting at all. Chinese paint on painting went on being pres uh, preserving the traditional resistance to change. The first lecture of the pair will be will uh, take the form of more of a survey and is based on a lecture that I gave a number of times in places during the 1990s when this topic is of special interest to me. I held a graduate seminar on the subject in 1995 and in that year, I think it was, I lectured also on this topic at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. The notes and the bibliography for my seminar uh, are accessible on my website as CLP Cahill Lectures and Papers number 165, which can be used to accompany this lecture. In April of 2004, I was in New York, invited by the annual Scholars Dinner Group is arranged by Judith Whitbeck, who was then the curator of Chinese gardens on Staten Island. And I gave my gardens lecture again for Asia Society. The lecture that follows then is adapted and expanded from that old, old lecture with quite a lot of new stuff added. The first images, please. I want to begin in my usual roundabout way by showing some images of landscape paintings familiar from earlier lectures to make a simple point that landscape paintings are likely to be composed according to their subject and purpose to convey some particular pictorial message. If it's a painting of reclusion, like this one by Wang Meng, the picture will often be divided between the area representing the recluse's dwelling, which is closed off from the outside world, and the area representing his option of moving out when he chooses to into the great world. Next. Paintings representing a Taoist retreat in the mountains such as this 10th century example from a Liao tomb, represent the entryway and the passage upward that lead to the retreat itself. And the whole picture is composed to convey this theme. A farewell painting, such as the one at right by the early Ming artist Wang Fu, is likely to show a farewell party on the foreground shore, a boat waiting to take away the person who's leaving, and a landscape that stretches into distance by marked intervals to represent his passage outward to his destination. Next. A hand scroll representing the approach to a temple, like this one by Wang Meng in the Liaoning Museum, is composed so that the person rolling it and looking at it experiences an imagination in the trip and the arrival at the goal, which is a Buddhist temple in this case. Next. This hanging scroll by Zhou Chun, seen in the previous lecture in this series, lays out familiar stages in an imagined journey, meant to be imagined as a kind of narrative, even though all the episodes are shown at once. The road coming in at lower left, the traveler and his servant crossing a bridge and approaching an inn or a hostel. Uh, that place with all the identifying features, and in the upper left, the roads that they will take, continuing on after stopping at the inn to rest. All this is familiar, and I bring it back to set the stage, so to speak, 
for the way I mean to present Chinese paintings of gardens, relating the composition of the paintings to the images or the plans of the gardens that they mean to convey, and sometimes representing also the route that we're supposed to take an imagination moving through the garden. Next. Some of what I'll be saying in this lecture can also be found in a different form in a book that I've co-authored with a young specialist in China named Huang Xiao, seen here with his wife Liu Shanshan, beneath the willows at the moat outside the Palace Museum in Beijing. Huang Xiao wrote me two years ago as a grad student at Beida or Peking University to say that he and his professor had found out who the owner was of the Jur Garden, the one portrayed in the great album by Zhang Hong, and asking me for images of that album for their research. They had found a unique copy in the Beijing Library of the literary works of the man who owned the garden, containing a Jur Yuanji, Ji, or Record of the Jur Garden. And this is, of course, great news, since nobody had identified the garden before. And we corresponded, and, the end, and in the end I proposed that we co-produce a book on Chinese paintings of gardens, using mostly images that I would send him, and some writings of my own that he and his wife Shan Shan would translate into Chinese, and of course add his own uh, researches and his own writing. The book is going to appear soon, and I recommend it, of course, to everybody. I certainly don't mean for the present lecture to draw interest away from the book, quite the reverse. Next. While I make a few preliminary remarks about my subject, I'm going to show an album of garden paintings that's in the Nanjing Museum, attributed to Shen Zhou, but not, I think, by him. Maybe a copy after his work. It's titled Dong Zhuang Tu, or Pictures of the East Lodge, and it's supposed to be his depiction of the garden of his friend Wu Quan. There are 21 leaves from what were originally 24. There's no signature or seals of Shen Zhou, but a colophon by Dong Chi Chong, written in 1612, says that there was originally a leaf with Shen Zhou's writing, which is now lost. I have nothing to say about the album, and I only show it for the interest of some of you. And I have something on screen while I make some general remarks about garden paintings from my old lecture. You'll see scenes of what were, must actually have been a large estate, some of it cultivated, several houses with people in them, a house with a portrait hanging in it. So, watch and enjoy. I began my old lecture by pointing out something obvious that nonetheless needed saying, that I am not an expert in Chinese gardens, and I don't pretend to be. My claim to expertise on the subject of my lecture is Chinese paintings of gardens. I went on to ask rhetorically, what is the basic aim of an artist who does a garden painting? It isn't, I think, primarily to provide information about the garden. Usually the painting is done for the garden's owner, who doesn't need to be told that. Rather, it's to commemorate the garden, to honor it, as a portrait does the sitter. It provides the owner with something to show his guests, for them to admire. And typically, it aims at evoking in the viewer an experience that's somehow analogous or congruent to the experience one has of visiting the garden. The artist presents visual materials, images that are recognizable as representing the materials and the spaces of the garden and its setting, arranging these so as to structure the viewer's experience, again in a way analogous to the way one experiences a real garden. Now think about the defining characteristics of a garden. Enclosure, the sense of security that it offers, or escape from the troubles and dangers of the outside world. In this function, it is, of course, only a part or an extension of the owner's walled-off compound or estate. Next, order or organization, the arrangement of materials and spaces, trees, rocks, bodies of water buildings, into a design piece of terrain. The making and placing of certain arrangements, which what the Chinese call jing, uh, or scenes, to evoke memories either of literary and historical themes and events, or of some themes and events in the life of the owner, and the poetic naming of these. The arrangement of all these so as to encourage certain ways of moving through the garden, or being in it, experiencing it, and enjoying it. When I gave my seminar, I used lots of slides made in real gardens in China, 
all reconstructions, of course, of old gardens, but preserving many of their distinctive features. I'm not showing these in this lecture to avoid any pretense of being a real garden specialist, so we'll see only paintings of gardens. Now, what of all this is transferable, so to speak, from one medium to another, from the garden to the painting, that is? But of course, it was a two-way relationship. The design of gardens followed, in some respects, the conventions of painting. From the time of the Yuan Ye by Ji Chung, written between 1631 and 1634, which is the earliest and the most informative treatise on gardens in Chinese, gar on gardens in China. It exists, by the way, in a good annotated English translation. Uh, the idea that a garden should be like a painting is expressed over and over. A person who built a garden thought of himself as inhabiting a work of art with all the attendant sense of transcending the real world. Close affinities between gardens and paintings affirmed and enhanced this feeling. Garden designers were often also painters. Chertau is a great example. You can see a garden in Yangzhou that was designed by him. The simple answer to the question of what is transferable is, it depends on how you use the media, medium of painting, what form you use, and how you ex employ that form. An aesthetic experience is a general category to which a visit to a garden belongs has certain characteristics. It stands somewhat apart from our everyday routine experience. It has a beginning and an end, and it's structured somehow within that theme and variations, building to a climax and subsiding and so forth. There are many other ways one could think about gardens. Craig Kunis, in his book titled Fruitful Sites, uh, writes about it as a profitable piece of land with orchards and edible or other valuable plants, uh, as a display of wealth, as a way of impressing guests, as a site for love affairs and other kinds of human interaction all imposed by the usages that the owners make of it. All these are relevant, but too much to encompass in a single lecture. So, we go on to the paintings. There are essentially three models for which the three standard forms that Chinese paintings commonly take are appropriate. First, a single comprehensive view of the garden in a hanging scroll. It's possible also in a tall hand scroll, not too long, so that it can be viewed all at once. In these, the garden is laid out like a map, seen from a high vantage point. It's as if the artist had led you to a nearby high hill and was pointing out the features of the garden visible from there. Second, B, a hand scroll or horizontal scroll can provide a pictorial analog to the more continuous linear experience of entering the garden, typically through a gate seen at the beginning of the scroll, strolling through it, and seeing its principal features, then leaving through another gate at the end of the scroll. It's as if the artist led you through the garden, directing your attention to important sites along the way. And third, see, the album, which can offer a series of views, 12 or 20 or more, uh, of scenes of the garden, pavilions, ponds, rockeries, and so forth, frequently with the name of each inscribed on the leaf. To continue my fanciful account, it's as if the artist blindfolded you and took you through the garden, turning you in the right direction and taking off the blindfold briefly so you could look at some designated scene while he tells you the name of it. Well, so much for my general introduction and the Dong Zhuang album, uh, which is wrongly attributed, as I say, to Chunzhou and the Danji Museum. Now we go on to look at particular garden paintings. Next. A fine example of the first type, the hanging scroll presenting a whole view of a garden, is this anonymous Ming, 15th or 16th century, I think, horizontal painting that went through auction in the 1980s. I have no idea where it is now. It's a detailed, technically high-level portrait of a riverside garden, complete with images of the owner and his servants and some indications of the best, how the best features of the garden were, were used. A row of bonsai, or uh, mi miniature trees, flowering trees, a table with seats, preparations for visitors. But it shows us only the part of the garden that's closest to us. The rest is hidden behind buildings and trees. 
The limitations of this kind of picture are apparent from this example. Handsome it is as a painting. Next. In the detail, we see the entrance to the garden, and outside it, the owner, the largest figure, and his guests making their way into it. The artist is fairly consistent in showing the objects and buildings as seen from above. The painting is unsigned and probably never had a signature. It's by one of those technically proficient Ming masters who continued Song traditions and who were consequently regarded as artisan painters, called in for particular purposes and occasions, uh, never given serious credit for what they did. Next. A painting by the early 18th century Yangzhou master Yuan Jiang in the Shanghai Museum, representing the Dongyuan, or Eastern Garden, takes the form of a tall hand scroll filled with detail, showing the entire layout of the garden. I don't have images of the whole, only two sections and a detail of one of them. This is, I believe, the opening of the scroll, showing the environs of the garden, I assume in Yangzhou, and the entrance at left. From an agricultural area with flooded rice paddies, we cross a bridge, pass through empty courtyards, and we reach, next please, we reach the garden proper, as seen here in a general view. Yuan Zhang was another unequivocally professional master, versatile and technically accomplished, to a degree that guaranteed him a low status in critical eyes. I've spoken of him in earlier lectures, remarking that his paintings are likely to contain more of interest to me than another of the quickly done brushworky pictures of bamboo and orchids and rock by his revered contemporary Zheng Xie, or Zheng Pan Zhao, which we are supposed to admire much more. Uh, in this picture by Yuan Zhang, we're given a great deal of visual information about the garden, and when we look closer, next please, we see the master and his guests sitting and talking at the entrance to his residence beyond a pond and flowering plants. One could, on the basis of such a picture, write a fairly detailed account of the layout of the garden and the buildings and the plants and the other materials that made it up. A centuries-long tradition enabled an artist like Yuan Zhang to take an imagined position high above the garden and present it as seen from an angle, and his viewers could read the painting that way. Next. A similar work from an earlier period, an anonymous Ming tall hand scroll in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, is seen here in this image of the whole. All I have except for a detail I'll show in a moment. I can't remember much about it, but it's, or who it's attributed to or anything like that, or anonymous as I say. Uh, but it's obviously the same kind of work as Yuan Zhang's, except shorter, showing only the garden itself laid out as seen from an elevation readable like a map. At the top center are the main buildings of the residence for which the rest is the garden. It appears to have been located on a hill. Just left of the center are other large buildings, red in color here, set diagonally. Before them is spread out the garden with successive walls, keeping intruders out, protecting those within. This looks more like an extensive estate than like a garden, some powerful princeling perhaps occupied it as his private part of the world. The foreground wall with an open gate in it offers no real entry to the hole. Beyond it is only another closed off area with no easy access to the spaces behind. Next. But if we look more closely at the upper right, we see the same pairing, presumably the owner and his guest, seated just inside an open building. Servants stand at the entrance to the inner court that they look out upon. Throughout there are blossoming trees, identifying the season, but also, as in other paintings you'll see, indicating that it's a kind of uh, cultivated or fruitful site described in Craig Kunis's book. Paintings like this one deserve more attention than they have received from garden specialists, uh, who typically illustrate their books mainly with photos of the modern reconstructions of famous gardens. What followed this in my old lecture was a brief showing of a hanging scroll by the Orthodox schoolmaster Wang Hui, showing the house of some patron and the garden around it and behind it. I don't any longer have an image of that, so I have to leave it out. Suffice it to say that such hanging scrolls were painted, but they were not an ideal form for conveying the layout 
from the look of the garden in any great detail. Next. Turning to the hand scroll, we can note that a short hand scroll can be spread out to present a single, all-encompassing view of the garden. The earliest extant portrayal specifically of a garden, the picture of the Shurzu Lin, or the Lion Grove Garden, by Nizan and Zhao Yuan, painted in 1373 and now lost, or at least lost when I put together this lecture, and viewable only in old photographs, is of this type. We can also read it, however, from right to left, the common way of reading a hand scroll, entering the gate, moving through the trees and buildings, and at the end, climbing the artificial mountain rockery to the monk's hut on top of it, meant to represent a retreat at the top of a towering mountain. Nizan and Zhao Yuan are reportedly involved in the planning of the garden. This picture presumably records their plan. Next. I should add that a painting looking very much like this so-called lost hand scroll, in fact, to my eyes, the very painting, has turned up in the collection of the Palace Museum in Beijing. It was shown for one in a, an exhibition organized by Zhang Hongxing for the National Museum of Scotland in 2002 under the title Treasures from the Forbidden City, the Qianlong Emperor. And it was number 45 in that exhibition catalog, which I show you here. I haven't seen it in the original, and I can only report that Xu Bangda and others of the Palace Museum connoisseurs take it to be a copy. Even as that, though, it merits some attention by future scholars. Next. I can add that a 12-leaf album representing the Shurzu Lin, or the Lion Grove Garden, same garden, was painted by Xu Ban, an artist whose period of activity spanned the late Yuan and early Ming. I know it only from an old reproduction book, and I have no idea whether it survives. The actual garden, the Lion Grove Garden, still exists, as many of you know, in reconstructed form with all the old rockeries in place. It was called the Lion Grove Garden, of course, because they, it contained a lot of rocks that looked like lions, were supposed to anyway. It was owned by the family of the architect I am Pei. I once met him and talked to them about it. I have lots of slides made there from an old, from an early visit, but I'm avoiding showing slides of real gardens, as I said before. Next. Let me remind you, while we're in the Yuan Dynasty, of the shorthand scroll by Wang Meng that I showed in an earlier lecture titled The Iris and Orchid Studio, showing the residence of a monk living near Suzhou who raised these plants. Wang Meng's painting lays out the house and its surroundings in a way that combines the natural and the constructed into a garden-like image. Next. The Yo Sung Yuan, or the Friend of the Pines Garden, was portrayed in a shorthand scroll by the early Ming literatus painter Du Chung, who is a relative of the owner. At the opening of the scroll, this owner is shown sitting with a guest, a high official, at the entrance to his house. A servant boy is at the gate. The style for its time is rather eclectic, adopting elements freely from the great Yuan masters, as these early Ming literati artists tended to do. It was not until the time of Shunzhou that a new, specifically Ming style, was developed. Next. As we roll the scroll further, we see the same two figures walking on a path outside the garden, accompanied by another boy servant carrying a chin or zither. Behind them on a stone table are two punsai, Japanese bonsai, or dwarf trees, and a bowl with some flowers growing in it. Beyond, a railing marks the furthest limit of the garden. The master Du Chong's relative is pointing the way forward to where they will sit and rest. Well, we'd best roll onward so that the disproportion of figures, the fault of the amateur artist, is not too apparent. Next, please. In this last section, the two appear again, seated at a table in lower right corner. And at the end of the scroll, a climax, an artificial mountain, reached through a cave door that offers escape into a world in miniature where they can sit by the pond and listen to the waterfall or visit a miniature Buddhist temple. Here we learn more than usually, and firsthand from a relative of the owner, about how the garden was experienced and enjoyed. Next. A long hand scroll by the great Ming master Chu Ying in the Cleveland Museum preserves the composition of a Song period scroll depicting the Du Luo Yuan, or Garden of Solitary Pleasure, 
in Luoyang, owned by the great 11th century statesman and historian Sima Guang. Sima Guang retired there in protest against the policies of the reformer Wang Anshu and composed an essay about the garden, which is the basis for the painting. Here, the hand scroll form is used to depict successive parts or features of the garden in a sequential way, with no, no attempt at uniting them into a spatial continuum or showing how they relate in space. This painting and the garden have been written about often, so I'll skip over it quickly. The scroll is long and full of detail. Chu Ying surely had older representations of the garden to derive his visual materials from. Older versions of the composition survive. I could spend a long time reading a translation of Sima Guang's essay and matching parts of it up with passages in the painting, but that would be a literary historical exercise more than an artistic one. And I'm just going to show the end of the scroll where buildings on the shore command a broad view out over the water to distant hills. Next. Another hand scroll ascribed to the same Chu Ying. This one, a tall painting on silk, is in the Nanjing Museum, painted in the archaistic blue and green style with lots of fine detail. And it offers another kind of sequential presentation of a garden, whether imaginary or real, I can't say, seen from an elevated viewpoint as if arranged on an upward slope. It's well populated with scholars and servants who act out the ways in which the garden was enjoyed. For instance, in reenacting the wine cup floating scene from the Lanting or Orchid Pavilion gathering, well known, the man in the pavilion in the foreground is taking the part of the great calligrapher Wang Shijie, who recorded the event. Next. A close-in detail reveals that only two scholar gentlemen are actually seated on the edge of the artificial stream, and four boy servants, one of them mostly hidden behind a rock behind them, take care of their needs, no doubt filling the wine cups and floating them down so the two can take them out and drink them, an elaborate procedure for a small traditional pleasure echoing a famous event. Next. The second central section of the scroll the bird's eye view gives the effect of passing over the garden, viewing it from a moving, elevated viewpoint. Boy servants are bustling about, watering plants, tending to the various needs of their masters. This is a fine example of the old convention by which each object is seen as if straight on, not from above, while the entire scene is laid out on a plane slanting back as if seen from an elevation. We saw this used as early as the Han Dynasty. The next. The detail shows us people in a house, one of them doing calligraphy, others outside strolling and reading, one hanging onto the trailing branch of a tree. This is a garden painting largely devoted to showing us uses of the garden in an ideal sense. The figures animate the scene and provide anecdotal interest as we try to figure out, looking closely, what they are doing. Next. The third and final section of the scroll presents the outer areas of the garden, the shore that borders it, and, as in other scrolls we've seen, a view across water to distant hills to conclude. Nearest to us we see a pond with geese. There are many leafy trees, some of them blooming. These may well be fruit trees, marking this as a fruitful garden in Craig Kunis's sense. So much land obviously couldn't be entirely devoted to the reenactment of traditional literati events and other non-productive activities. Next. The key to the uses of a garden is selection. Just as you select rocks, trees, buildings, and other things to construct your private world, arranging or positioning them all in an order that you and some garden designer have selected, so you can select friends to invite and activities to sponsor, narrowing real experiences to those you choose, instead of those that everyday life thrusts rudely upon you a universal ideal. In another lecture, we will have a section on love in the garden that will expand in a less literary, more real-life direction on this observation. Next. Sometime in the 15th century, it would appear, a new type of garden hand scroll composition is invented. The earliest example known to me is this one, ascribed unfirmly to Shunzhou. It went through auction long ago 
and I photographed it, and again I have no idea where it is now. It certainly isn't, I'm sure, by Shunjo. It's probably the work of some later Ming amateur master, reattributed to raise its value. That it's certainly by an amateur artist is indicated by the difficulty he has connecting the wall to the gate, or rather he doesn't even try to connect them. A trained master would have shown us exactly how they are connected. In this new program, one enters the garden through a gate at the beginning, makes one's way through it, observing notable features along the way, and leaves it at the end. Many scrolls of this type survive, I'll show only a few of them briefly. We move through a grove of diverse flowering and other trees. We cross a plank bridge, see in the lower left of this section, beyond which is a pond, its surface reflecting the blue of the sky, over which two dragonflies are flitting. Next. Rolling on, we encounter the host and his guests sitting outside the house, one of them leaning on a simply drawn stone table. In the entryway to the house, antiquities are set out for their appreciation. Next. Rolling further, we leave the garden at the end. Seals identify famous owners, from Xiang Renbian in the Ming to the late Zhuang Shuizhong. These are, of course, parts of the experience of the scroll for Chinese viewers, but they're not our concern here, except insofar as they indicate, if they're genuine, that the Shunzhou attribution was credited by some. They wouldn't have put their seals on it if they, if they didn't credit it. More developed forms of this hand scroll type show an exit from the garden at the end. This early one just trails off inconclusively. Next. An example by the later Ming master Chen Gu, the Chiu Garden, portrayed in a hand scroll by him in 1564, follows this scheme. Entry through a gate into a courtyard before the main entrance to the house. The master and a guest strolling through the arbors and courtyards, the servant seen bringing them things on a tray. These are such standard features of these paintings, they could almost be transferred from one to another. Shen Gu is actually a highly competent professional master, but as a follower of Wen Zheng Ming, I say this from memory, he adopts some of the mannerisms of the amateurs in his drawing. And in the second half of the scroll, a pond with ducks and geese, a well, exit at the end where the painting's, painter's signature and dedication appear. Okay, next. A particularly fine use of this hand scroll type was accomplished by the late Ming artist Sun Ko Hung in a scroll that he painted in 1572 representing the Stone Table Garden, formerly in the Kontag collection. It's now in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Sun Ko Hung's long inscription for the painting, mounted at the end of the scroll and now on the screen, praises this garden as the most beautiful in the region and relates how the owner, Mr. Lu Yashan, planted a long grove of thousands of tall bamboo and placed in the middle of it a large stone table, building a pavilion over it. On nights of the full moon, he would assemble his friends there to play games and compose poems. Next. A short passage of bare terrain opens the scroll with a city wall visible beyond. We begin, that is, outside the garden, and the scroll will offer us the experience of entering and seeing what it contains. Next, please. In this detail, we see a boy servant coming toward the gate, uh, which will be in the next section, uh, carrying what appears to be a scroll. The landscape style is a fairly conventional broad brush literati style, tradition of Huang Gung Wang and Shenzhou, with the orthodox combination of cool, that is blue-green, and warm reddish coloring, and lots of dotting. Next, please. In the second section, we are shown the proper entrance to the garden through a gate. Below on the path, a portly scholar gentleman wearing a blue cap and walking with a staff uh, turns to pass through the entry between banks of earth. Next. His small boy servant, seen behind and below him, carries a package on a pole over his shoulder, probably some gift he is bringing to Mr. Lu, the owner of the garden. The trees are of many types and colors with foliage distinguished within the amateur conventions. The groves of bamboo are shown with blue-green color washes and a fine pattern of bamboo leaves. Next. The part of the garden just inside the gate features a pond and a row of ornamental rocks. 
a thatched roof tinza, where one sits to gaze out over the pond is at the right, partly hidden behind leafy trees. Two cranes are seen, one just outside the tingza, the other on the far side of the pond. Behind is the dense grove of bamboo, and at the left another wall, with an opening leading out to a space where a bridge crosses a canal, leading on to the next section, next. Lined up in front of the pond are a series of ornamental rocks, set up in the garden as natural ornaments. Some of them, the ones with holes, come from the shore of the Taihu, or the Great Lake, near Sujo, and were called Taihu Shur. Next. Closer in, with a better look at the rocks. Sun Kohung was not the kind of artist who can paint the rocks so as to show their volume. In spite of some shading, his rocks are nearly flat, bluish or dark gray-black in color. A banana palm grows among them. Next. Sometime in the 1980s, my painter friend Chung Shir Fa, to whom I devoted the second lecture in the series, took me to Sungjiang on a day trip from Shanghai to show me his old home, which was being made into a museum honoring him. And nearby was a kind of park, which he told me was the site of Sun Kohung's old garden, with its ornamental rocks still set up in place. Sun was famous as, among other things, a rock collector. Next. Here are two of the rocks, large and small. You understand that these are not the rocks shown in the stone table garden, the subject of the painting. These are the rocks in the old garden of Sun Kohung, the artist. Locating the sites of old gardens is a task that challenges historians of gardens. But in most cases, even when they are located, nothing much of anything of the old garden is still to be seen or only a restoration. The great period of the Chinese garden was the late Ming in the early 17th century, and too much has changed in the three or four centuries since then. Next. With this fourth section, we arrive at last at the climax of the scroll, where we see the stone table pavilion itself, containing the object that gives the building and the garden its name. Mr. Lu is seen leaning on the railing to watch a servant outside watering potted plants. Behind him are the stone table itself, and on it, antique bronze vessels, an inkstone, and a case of books. A finely drawn old cypress tree is at left, a willow in the foreground, tall leafy trees further back, and all around the densely growing bamboo grove, looking impenetrable. Although I know from happy experience that mostly one can walk into bamboo groves and sit within them to escape the sun. Next. A detail, our final one for this scroll. We can imagine the full moon parties held here, as described in Sun Kohung's inscription, with drinking games and composing poems. The profound difference between Chinese and Japanese gardens has often been observed. Typical Japanese gardens are mainly for contemplation, as one sits on the veranda and gazes out over them. At most, one strolls along paths or steps on stepping stones, careful not to deviate from the prescribed routes. Chinese gardens are definitely for participation, sometimes quite vigorous, drunken parties and the like, as well as sexual encounters. Chinese erotic albums, from which I'll show a few typical leaves in a later lecture, usually include scenes of sexual goings-on in gardens. How much of this really happened, I can't say. It's hard to imagine this happening in a Japanese garden, in which there was no furniture of the kind that would make one uncomfortable, uh, and one would be afraid of upsetting the aesthetic balance. The Chinese garden is more accommodating in this respect. If we roll further to a section of which I have no image, we see the path through the garden disappearing into a grove of bamboo, then emerging from the back gate of the garden. The artist's long inscription which I showed at the beginning, follows. Next, please. A brief look at a hand scroll of this type by the 19th century master Shu Gu, painted in 1834 and executed in his distinctive and sensitive brushwork. The opening shows us a guest approaching the garden, about to enter an area of flowering trees. Next. Behind these flowering trees, which grow outside the wall, Two other arriving guests are seen, perhaps waiting for their friend to join them. Next. Moving through the open gate, we pass beneath a row of trees with rich masses of pink blossoms, some kind of fruit trees, presumably. 
beyond is a rockery and more pink-flowered trees. Next. And as we roll on, the master of the garden is shown, seated at an outdoor table, waiting for his guests, watching a servant with a broom, who, we must assume, is sweeping up the fallen flower petals. It's a spring gathering for gazing into the blossoming trees. How well I remember the gatherings of that kind held in parks in Kyoto, or further north at Yase, when people would sit on mats spread beneath the trees, drinking, drinking lots and lots of sake or whiskey or whatever, gazing at the trees, inhaling the fragrance. The painting conjures up imaginings of that kind of pleasure. Uh, tall rocks stand outside the entryway to the house, into which we can enter in imagination. Next. And as we roll beyond to the end of the scroll, we depart through more flowering trees. The artist's title, Meihua Shu Wu, or Studio Among the Blossoming Plum Trees, is written above, with a date corresponding to 1834 and Shugu's signature. This hand scroll was auctioned by Christie's in New York and set in 1987. I have no idea where it is today. Next. I will show and speak briefly about several more hand scrolls depicting gardens before turning to our last form, the album. Here's a hand scroll by the Qing period court artist Chen Wei Chung, a practitioner of the orthodox mode of landscape as it was practiced within the academy. He was given the command by the Qianlong Emperor in 1774 to depict the approach to the Shurzhou Lin, or Lion Grove Garden in Suzhou, and the garden itself, to commemorate the emperor's visit to that place on his southern tour in 1757. About the scroll that Chen Wei Chung produced, one can only say that it follows all the orthodox school rules for what you can do and what you cannot do in a landscape painting, and that as a result it fails utterly as a depiction of the place and the garden. Chen Wei Chung could hear those admonitory voices in his ears. Don't slip into a really pictorial style. Don't paint things the way they look. Use only forms within the repertory laid down for us by our, by our respected predecessors, the Four Wongs and others. So we have conventional signs for buildings, for rocks, for trees a crashing bore, in my view. It was sold at auction at Sotheby's in New York in 1986, and I hope the purchaser was a lover of orthodox school landscape and not a lover of good painting. Okay, enough of that. Next. A more important garden hand scroll in the British Museum, which I do not remember seeing published, but which I photographed when I was there, is one that seems to have two titles, Ban Yuan, or Half Garden, the title written on it by the artist in his inscription, and Ai Yuan, or Love Garden, the title used in the Ai Yuan Ji, or Love Garden record that follows the painting, recording where it was located, how it was planned and built, etc. Someone else can resolve this double name problem. I want only to call attention to the scroll. It was painted by Tang Yifan, a learned man who lived in Wujin in Jiangsu province, his dates are 1779 to 1853, and he painted the scroll in 1848. Next. Tang Yifan himself has written a long inscription near the beginning of the scroll, using the title Ban Yuan, or Half Garden. As you can see from the drawing of the distant gate and the buildings in the distance seen below the inscription, he works as an amateur painter, but a fine calligrapher. Next. But this section of the scroll, the main depiction of the garden, lays it all out with considerable expertise. I don't mean to spend much time on it, and I'll only show a few details. Next. This one from the lower left, showing a bridge leading into the garden, and a two-storied hall with open porch beyond, for gazing out over the lotus pond. Next. A six-posted tile roof tingsa to the right of this, seen beyond misty bamboo groves. Various paths, walls, gates, two cranes, next. An ornamental rock that is seen in this detail to have an old cypress tree growing over it and an open house behind. Next. Uh, an open house which, moving leftward, proves to be part of a large cluster of houses, more a residential complex than part of a garden, with two men seen outside, one of them showing the row of small growing bushes to the other. Next. The garden record that follows the painting, as seen here, is dated 1848, 
the same year in which Tang Yifan painted the scroll. This work would be a good research topic for somebody who can reconcile the two names for the garden and other problems that it presents. Next. To end our consideration of garden hand scrolls, let me just mention that paintings in this form by the major Ming master Wen Zheng Ming, such as this one titled Dung Hu Zhao Tang, or Thatched Cottage at East Lake, are not really garden pictures at all, but conventional arrangements of a house on the shore, often with people in it, visitors arriving, a recession into distance. Uh, numbers, of the, numbers of these are treated in Craig Hunus's book, Elegant Debts, which is about Wen Zheng Ming and his patrons. Wen Zheng Ming appears to make little effort to individualize them, and he's too lofty a literatus to engage in the trivia of real garden portrayal. Next. It's true that albums of paintings of gardens exist that are supposed to be by Wen Zheng Ming. Uh, what I'm showing are six leaves, all that I seem to have, from an eight-leaf album in the Metropolitan Museum ascribed to Wen Zheng Ming, which presents prominent places in the Zhao Zhongyuan, uh, or Garden of the Unsuccessful Politician in Suzhou, another garden that you can see in a reconstruction. The album exists in more than one version, and I remember in my seminar on Wen Zhengbing leaning toward accepting another one in a Taiwan collection as better and more likely to be genuine. But authenticity is not fortunately our concern here. This album and its relatives were studied in the Princeton doctoral dissertation of Jan Stewart, someone I respect highly. She was for years a curator at the Freer Gallery. Now she is the head of the Asiatic Department at the British Museum. Uh, these scenes are, in any case, depicted in a schematic and amateurish manner. Next. More reliable is the real work of the artist to whom it's ascribed is the album of Ten Views of the Nansun, or Southern Village, the villa of the great late Yuan literatus Tao Tsung Yi, the one about the, whom the Princeton historian Frederick or Fritz Mote wrote so brilliantly in an early article on aromatism. The album was painted by the same Du Chung, who painted the short hand scroll that we saw before, portraying the Yo Sung, Friend of the Pines Garden, owned by his relative. Um, the album is dated 1437, and it's in the Shanghai Museum. I have images of six of the ten leaves, and I'll show those as I talk about the album form. Next. This third form in which gardens are represented in Chinese paintings, the album, typically offers a series of labeled pictures of notable views, or jing, in the garden. No attempt is made to connect these spatially. The garden in this version is an assemblage of designated sites. The visitor moves from one to the next, perhaps with a running account by his host of the meanings behind their titles. An early example, devoted to the Shurzhi Lin, or the Lion Grove Garden, is attributed, insecurely I think, to the late Yuan master Xu Ban. Unfortunately, I don't have images uh, of, that, of that album to show. Like the one by Du Chong, it bears written titles identifying the sites. About the style of this one, I will say only that it makes sense as the work of a literatus predecessor of Shenzhou. The next, please. Finally, an album painted in 1625 by the Sengjiang artist Shan Shu Chung is made up of scenes of a garden called the Jiao Yuan, or Suburban Garden, in the artist's inscription he dedicates it to Yan Ke, which is one of the names used by the early Orthodox school artist Wang Shermin, who was a rich landowner, and the garden was probably his. I reproduced one leaf from this in black and white, in my late Ming book, The Distant Mountains. This is the one now on screen. And I comment on it that it interestingly suspends the main materials of the scene in mist and arranges them diagonally across the space of the leaf, an interesting new compositional device. I have slides of three more leaves, and I'll show those now. Next. In this leaf, the angled view stretches the shoreline of the villa diagonally across the upper corner, with only the tops of the trees seen below. In the fourth lecture in this series, the one on the early Orthodox masters and Xiaomi, we saw highly innovative compositional devices used by Xiaomi, working around the same time and not far away. Shen Chung was in Sengjiang, 
heavily under the influence of Dung Chi Chong and the other literati painters. And we can only admire it when he exhibits an independence from that proto-orthodoxy that allows such paintings as this. Next. A leaf titled simply Lo Ge, or Storied Halls and Pavilions, which again adopts an elevated vantage point that sees the buildings and trees through heavy fog, arranged diagonally from lower left to upper right. Next. The last leaf, with the artist's inscription, and another one, in which the view is oddly angled from an extreme elevation. We can only wonder what the owner of the garden, Wang Shermin or whoever it was, thought of the album. He may have wanted one that really showed viewers what his garden looked like from down inside it. Or more likely, Shan Shi Chung deliberately used a highly innovative program and compositional devices for a patron who he knew would appreciate those. And finally, next. That completes our fast survey of Chinese garden pictures done in the three standard forms and the kinds of experiences that they convey. Fine as these all might be as works of art, none was adequate to provide comprehensive and believable visual accounts of the gardens because of obvious problems of uh, spatial disjuncture, limitations of a single vantage point, and conventionalization. But of course that was not their purpose. The feat of leaving these all behind and creating a completely new, and to my knowledge, completely unparalleled and unrepeated visual record of a great garden was accomplished in the late Ming by the artist Zhang Hong in his 20-leaf Jur Garden album. Once divided among four collections, it's now in two, 12 leaves in LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, eight in the Bruin Museum, former Venati collection. This album, along with some other paintings by Zhang Hong and some by an equally uh, innovative outsider in late Ming painting, that is Wu Bin, will make up the subject of uh, the second of this uh, pair of lectures. Both of these two are artists whom I myself brought to prominence they hadn't enjoyed before in traditional Chinese writings, and my lecture will accordingly be one that's full of deep commitment and frequent lapses into personal reminiscences and commentary. Very much of the same has been true in this one, and I hope it's also been enlightening as a visual treatment of a subject that's hitherto neglected. But it's a subject to be treated with much expertise by my young collaborator Huang Xiao in our forthcoming joint book on Chinese paintings of gardens, which I mentioned at the beginning. And with that, I end this very long lecture. Mm -hmm.